The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. And today we're... um, We're talking about, um, well, we're talking to Paula Baker Laporte. Um, She is a graduate from the University of Toronto and the School of Architecture in 1978 and from the International Institute of Building Biology and Ecology in 1995. Paula has dedicated her practice to the precepts of environmentally sound and health enhancing architecture. She's also the author of Prescriptions for a Healthy House. We often don't realize in our modern culture that we are, we are unaware aware of the toxicity around us and especially when we're ill we assume that our homes are a safe place and that may not always be the case so Paula welcome to the show thank you for having me so how did you get involved in building healthy houses well I was uh, a regular architect and it just so happened that I got sick from a chemical overexposure in a home a new home I was living in and so it opened up uh, my eyes and a whole new world of a better way to build. You know, it's something similar happened to me. I had been working in um, an office that was brand new and, mm-hmm. um, you know, not newly renovated, but brand new. And that's, you know, I, I do have chronic Lyme, but that's when everything really hit ahead. I was not able to function anymore. And um, it wasn't even realized until I was well out of that building. It wasn't even the reason why I left there. Um, You know, it was uh, just, I realized later what had happened. And I think a lot of people don't realize how um, toxic their environment is because we think and assume that things are safe for us. Your story is not, unfortunately, unusual and similar to mine, too. The, it took me about 10 years from the time I left the building that was making me sick till I had a proper diagnosis and found out what was wrong with me and could do something about it. Yeah, and I think if you if you don't know, then, of course, you, you're not treating it properly and probably assuming that it's, you know, depression or something like that. Sure, and one of the big problems is that uh, you know this as a physician, and I know this as an architect, that the professionals involved often have no idea yeah. that the, it's the environment that's the root of someone's ill health. And so um, how is a lay person supposed to understand this if the professional doesn't? Yeah, exactly. So what exactly is building biology? Okay, uh, well, when I became... Ill, I began to look for solutions everywhere, and there wasn't a lot of information out in the, um, this is the early 90s, and one of the things I stumbled across was building biology, and it had a very different approach than our North American approach, the bit of information I did have on building healthy, in that it's a nature-based and ecologically-based system that came out of Germany after World War II. And uh, I immediately felt in alignment with it because I was someone who was doing all the other things. I understood organic food, for example, and the value of it, not just health-wise, but socially and economically and on every other level. And so this was an eye-opener that we could also look at a building in the same way. So it advocates, uh, amongst many other things, uh, nature is the gold standard for a healthy human environment. So what does it mean to have a healthy house? 
Well, it can mean many different things. Uh, at the very least, it means a home that doesn't make you sick. And, in fact, most of what we call healthy housing is simply housing that is devoid of toxics, which is a huge accomplishment in itself, but there's much, much more that can be done to nurture us in our homes. So, um, you know, a lot of time when we're talking about this toxicity, I know a lot of people may, this might be new information for them. Um, so what exactly are the, is the toxicity that can happen in a house? Well, the truth is that we, uh, our homes are now made out of uh, many, many products that didn't exist 100 years ago, and they exist now because of advances in chemistry. And um, so what do we know about the chemicals in our environment? There's about uh, 84,000 registered chemicals. And the shocking thing is is there's um, only complete testing on about 7% of those. And of that very small percentage, we know that some of the chemicals that go into our homes can be carcinogens, mutagens, or um, reproductive, reproductive toxicants. So it's pretty shocking when you look at the big picture, first about how much we don't know, and secondly, about how much of the little we do know goes unregulated in our buildings. So is this something new to have this many chemicals? Uh, Yeah, well, prior to World War II, there essentially were very few um, man-made chemicals in our environment. And so this is new within the last, you know, uh, I'm trying to think how many years it was since World War II, but, you know, a very, it's, it's uh, less than a fraction of a blink in human history that we've introduced all these chemicals into our environment. And sometimes effects of certain chemicals take generations to show up. Yeah, I think it. You know, it, it it's shocking when you say you know eighty four thousand chemicals are being used, and um, this is all new to us, and we have no idea um, what this is doing to us. So when you look at people like you and me that have been affected, how many people are being affected but aren't aware of what's happening to them? That's a very good question. Yeah, and uh, I often speak to people who aren't aware that they're chemically sensitive and yet they have classic symptoms. And when I speak to them further, it becomes obvious that they have been exposed to chemicals and that they are affecting them. I I have this experience in clinic as well, you know, when I do my investigation of what can happen and, you know, you talk to someone and their symptoms started when they moved to a new house Mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's brand new and they're, they're, um, they never relate it to that because no one ever thinks that this brand spanking new house will cause you, you know, problems. Uh, Rebecca, that is such an important question for doctors to be asking their patients and uh, their Doctors who are aware of that are few and far between. Yeah, I agree. Um, so what exa- exactly are multiple chem- chemical sen- sensitivities, or MCS? The MCS uh, is short form for multiple chemical sensitivities, and there are many other terms that uh, dance around the same uh, con- condition, uh, chemical hypersensitivity or sick building syndrome or... Uh, now we hear more and more about electromagnetic sensitivity. But uh, generally, uh, people with MCS are people who are reacting to the chemicals in their environment at very low levels, some of them, and some of these levels that are, were always considered to be safe. Um, and some people, actually I have met hundreds and hundreds of people over the years I've been working with this now who simply cannot find an indoor environment uh, where they can feel good and safe uh, because they're so sublimely sensitive now. Um, Well, and like you said, over the last few years, we've had this increase, so there probably isn't a safe indoor environment at this point, if there's anything new in it. (laughs) Well, um, the good news is uh, you can, safe environments can be built, and um, are being built, and um, 
there are more and more better products on the market, so it's actually becoming easier. So it's not an impossible task. It is a very simple task to make the average home healthier. It's, it is a complex task to create an environment where someone who is very now very, very sensitive can um, be uh, healthy in. So the, what are the symptoms that if um, you had with your um, sensitivities when you got ill? I know there's probably a lot of people listening going, well, what, what happens to people? What are their symptoms? Yeah. So one of the unusual puzzles for physicians is that it, um, it affects different people in different ways. There are some, I think I was um, pretty, pretty, I had pretty well-known uh, symptoms, except there was no one to diagnose them at first. Um, I was sensitized particularly to uh, a chemical called formaldehyde, which is thankfully um, more and more people are aware of it, but it was very prevalent in brand new homes um, back at the time when I was uh, exposed to it and how many, and you know who knows what other chemicals were in the environment at that time. And my symptoms were um, essentially, uh, I felt like I'd been run over like by a train every morning, um, but very specifically, um, my digestion was affected, I had um, sore muscles, and when I came into an environment where I was directly in contact with formaldehyde or a multiple list of other chemicals, I would get foggy-brained or... Um, angry or uh, lose my train of thought, you know, so it affected me uh, mentally, physically, and emotionally all at once, and uh, for me, you know, some people, there are people who will fall into a seizure without knowing why, so mine were just, my symptoms were mild, and so I just felt a little ill all the time, and I was very, and like many people, uh, very hypersensitive to smells. So uh, someone walked in the room with a scented deodorant or hand cream or aftershave. Um, they might have been, might as well have been wearing the, you know, rolled in dog poop or something for how bad they smelled to me. I just couldn't tolerate it, and still don't like it. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I have an office that is. Um, it, you know, perfume free, and we encourage everybody not to wear extra scents. Although sometimes people don't realize, and um, I I think that the reactions are so vast because, as you said, there's eighty four thousand chemicals. So we don't um, we don't you know the reaction can be different to everything. So it's really hard to pinpoint what's going on. Yeah, and I ha- I have to say too, it's not just. Uh, chemicals that can be in an environment. There's bioaerosols like mold. It mm-hmm. can there can be combustion gases. So someone can be getting a small dose of carbon monoxide. And I think you'll agree with me that the symptoms could be the same for all of these. So one really needs to once a person realizes something's going on, there really needs to be a thorough investigation so you don't miss the root cause. And so often it's several things acting together. Mm-hmm. That overexposure, like mm-hmm. it, you know, in my case, having been in an office that was brand new, who knows what was in there? Everything was new, you know. It was chemical soup, and yeah. no one has. There has been no uh, studies done on the uh, effects of several chemicals interacting in the environment together. We know that uh, one fairly harmless thing could potentiate another fairly harmless thing, but has um, a lot of pesticide uh, science is based on on things potentiating one another, and yet when you walk into a new building and it smells new, what you're smelling is a chemical soup. Chemical soup, I like that. (laughs) I've never heard that before. (laughs) I didn't invent it. (laughs) That is exactly what it is. Um, So we... um, (sighs) What what is, is this? What indoor air pollution is? Is that just all of this stuff all together? Um, you know, being involved in that enclosed space. Usually, it's not just one thing. So it's okay. usually several things interacting, and um, many people don't know that our indoor air is usually many times more polluted than an outdoor street with lots of traffic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So we're going to take a quick break. Today we're speaking to Paula Baker Laporte, who's the author of Prescriptions for a Healthy House. Um, we're talking today about um, she is an architect and does build healthy homes, but also just how to recognize what's going on and what you can do to help yourself. If you have any comments or questions about this show, you can uh, send us an email at anantacalgary at gmail.com or message us on Facebook or Twitter. And we'll be back shortly. Tune in every Tuesday for C. diff, spores, and more with hosts Nancy Kerala and Dr. Chandra Bali Ghosh. Our program is to provide information about C. diff, healthcare associated infections, and more. Nancy is a C. diff survivor, healthcare professional, and the founder and executive director of the C. diff Foundation. And Dr. Ghosh is the chairperson of research and development for the C. diff Foundation. Together with their guests, we'll explore infection prevention, treatments, environmental safety, and more. Listen every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. Abortion can affect an entire family. This includes men, women, other family members, and friends. While each experience is unique, the feelings of grief and loss are something everyone can relate to. Listen for Life After Abortion with hosts Michaeline Friedenberg and Skylar Christensen. Together with their guests, they can help open the conversation and bridge the gap toward healing. Life After Abortion can be heard Mondays at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, on Voice America Health and Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. And today I'm talking with Paula Baker Laporte, who is the co author of Prescriptions for a Healthy House. Um, she is the ar- architect of the authors of those. And we're talking today um, of, of about how basically how to recognize um, indoor air pollution, multiple chemical sensitivities, and what you can do to help yourself and your family. So, Paula, um, you know, there's probably a lot of people listening. You mentioned earlier that you can um, have a, a healthy home. You can build one. And I'm guessing you can also create one with, with what um, you have. So what? how does somebody go about starting to do this? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that um, as a building biologist, we believe that any improvement is worthwhile. And really, if you're working with an existing house, um, the biggest thing to start working on is the biggest thing that's wrong with it, and that's going to depend on the house. It may be your heating system, your duct work. It may be uh, chemicals that have been added to the house. It may be habits that you have as a homeowner, the things you're bringing into the house. So um, I know you're probably going to ask me about cost because that always is um, an important question. And... First thing I answer to that is um, it's very expensive to get sick, and it, uh, our children are much more vulnerable than we are, and so it's you know heartbreaking to have a child who's going through any kind of pain or illness. Uh, having said that, some things cost absolutely nothing more. Some things cost more, but they're of higher quality. And some things are simply going to cost more to get as a non-toxic item, as something that won't make you sick and is well, in my books, well worth it. So we we start wherever you're at, and then go from go from there. Look at the worst problems first, and there's never just one solution. So there are many many ways to improve the air quality in a home. So if somebody's listening to the show and they're wondering how do I know if my air quality is okay, what should what should they do? 
Sure. Well, the first thing uh, to notice, is my house making me sick? Well, the first uh, thing people often notice is they're feeling really sick or they have a cold that won't go away or a cough that just won't quit. And then they go away for the weekend. They go to a cousin's house or they travel somewhere and they feel just fine. And then they come back and they feel sick again. So that's a definite clue. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another clue is um, as plain as the nose on our face. We have a sublime instrument. Some people's instruments are more sublime than others for detecting what does our air smell like. So the only problem with that instrument is it only works for the first few minutes that you walk in the door, and then after that you get used to whatever your house smells like, and then uh, it, you can't distinguish. But one thing to do if you're coming in, especially from a very fresh outdoor environment, is use your nose. What do I smell when I walk in the door? Does it smell good? Does it smell bad? And then, of course, uh, consider how you always consider how you feel and be a bit of a detective for your own health so that when you see your healthcare professionals, like when you go to visit uh, Rebecca, you have uh, done some detective work already and you can help her out in the diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um are there any tests, is there any testing people can do? Uh, of the house? Yeah. yeah Does that exist course. for all these chemicals? Do we have anything like that? Yes, there's some very sophisticated testing that can be done now. Uh, there are air samples that can be taken, and you'll get back um, quite a robust report that will tell you if there's mold, uh, what types of mold, what chemicals they found in the air, where they might be found, like in a paint or a varnish or et cetera. So there are some very good tests out out there now. Also, an uh, an inspector who's experienced with uh, chemical sensitivities or health problems in houses knows how to look for the signs of um, potential problems. Uh, Okay. I can give some Um, examples of What's the most common problem that you see? Um, Well, there are several common problems. Um, There's the problem that you had where someone is in a new or newly renovated building and they start to be symptomatic. Um, There's a problem where there's some kind of a flood or a leak and then mold begins to form. Uh, more and more there are people who uh, they get a smart meter installed or a tower goes up near them and then they actually become sensitive to electromagnetics and that seems to be one of the faster growing things that I hear about. So let's talk about the mold a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. How does, um, does that always come with a flood or is there other ways that mold can happen in our home? Oh, well, there are, there are many ways that mold can happen, but it takes a few, uh, it just takes a, mold exists everywhere, and it, it just takes a few conditions to give it a party, and those are, you need a, some form of moisture, it doesn't have to be uh, your roof caved in, it could be that you're taking showers and not turning on the fan, and you notice that there's a little bit of black forming around the grout in your shower, it can be as simple as that. Um, often there's undetected problems in walls. Uh, water gets in and can't get out, gets trapped, things in the wall. You know, we build with things that are mold prone these days, like uh, drywall has paper on either side. That's anything with cellulose is a mold food. Often uh, people have damp conditions under their house in a crawl space, and they turn on a kitchen fan and suddenly all that moldy air that's sitting under the house gets sucked into the house. That's common, too. Hmm. Okay. And so um, now with removing mold, how does somebody go about doing that? It, uh, well, there are, I can, my, one of my co-authors, John Banta, it completely specializes in mold remediation, and his company teaches mold remediators how to do it, and it's very, very um, regulated 
it, it should be done properly. A homeowner should not tear into their walls to see if there's mold because they can just um, end up spreading that all over the house. So if there is a suspected or known mold condition, it that should be contained and then fixed by someone who's equipped to do that. Okay, I think that's important to note. Um, You know, when I was in school, I didn't know that, and I cleaned up mold in my uh, place I was renting, and I was sick for months after. Mm, It um, happens. Yeah, of course, you know, it's not taken very seriously where I am anyway, and um, um, it it, uh, causes a lot of health problems. I was sick for a long time with that. Yeah, um, and, and probably contributed um, to the reason why you perhaps reacted in that sick building and other people were just fine because you already had a, an incident that lowered yeah. your your system, yeah. your immunity, and that's yeah. often the case. I, I found that interesting in your book when you talked about mice um, had increased allergies when they were mm-hmm. exposed to a chemical, mm-hmm. and then the allergies increased because I, I don't think there's any of us that aren't exposed to chemicals and there are way more allergies than there used to be in in the world. You know, it's um, nobody can figure out why there's so many allergies and uh, this can very well be, you know, the cause or one I of the contributing you, factors. Yeah, I think you just said something very important and it really is sad how many uh Younger people are now living with allergies. When I was a child, uh, my brother was born with allergies, and it was so rare back then that he made the front page of the Toronto Daily Star with a Victoria Order nurse coming to give him an allergy injection. It was voodoo science back in the 50s. Yeah, and now it's, you know, every second kid, it seems. Yeah. yeah, there are some pretty shocking statistics about uh, allergies and especially asthma, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's increasing, uh, definitely. So you mentioned electromagnetic fields. Um, mm-hmm. What is that, and how does it affect us? Well, um, I would say that this is a funny area to be talking about because um, it's kind of where allergies were in the 50s at a lot of... Um, health professionals and doctors and scientists are saying, you know, this is nonsense, uh, something we can't see or smell or feel or touch cannot be affecting us. And a lot of what I learned, I learned from people who've been affected, you know, uh, long before uh, doctors were at all knowledgeable about multiple chemical sensitivities and still sending uh, patients to psychiatrists, I was talking to person after person who had been made sick, and probably the only reason I was so receptive and interested was because I had suffered from the same thing. Um, So nowadays, um, just judging from the phone calls that I get, uh, um, I'm seeing much more of this. The Building Biology Institute teaches the most comprehensive classes that I know of about how to measure and remediate electromagnetic problems. It seems that the whole thing took a huge jump when we decided to go wireless and to blanket um, North America and probably the world with uh, microwave towers everywhere. Well, we didn't have wireless internet even when, you know, when I was growing up. And uh, so I think just like the exposure to the chemicals, it's something that we'll find out about later when we see kids growing up in it, because we don't, we're mm-hmm. kind of an experiment, it seems. Yes, we are. Yeah. yeah. So um, so what is somebody, how does somebody even know that that's affecting their house? That, it's, uh, that there's a problem in their house? Yeah, with the, the EMFs. Oh, um. Well, uh, it, there are, um, if you go to the IBE website, the International Institute for Building Biology and Ecology, there is a Find an Expert page, and um, many of the experts are trained in electromagnetic uh, field measurement. So it's not something, as I said, it's not something we can see or touch or smell. Some people can hear them. Um, but it's, there are, is instrumentation that can measure, um, basically what they're measuring is deviation from uh, nature. 
from the natural electromagnetic, you know, the Earth has um, subtle electromagnetic currents, and so do our um, our bodies. We're uh, uh, medical uh, research is showing more and more that we're uh, electrical beings, and uh, so there's a lot that can be uh, measured, but one needs to have the instrumentation and um, the knowledge of how to use that. So uh, for anything comprehensive, it's best to hire someone who knows what they're doing and has the equipment. Okay. And um, how can somebody protect themselves if that's going on? Okay. So first of all, in day-to-day life, uh, there are certain things you can do to help yourself. Uh, Building biology, uh, you know, there's a realization that you're not going to be able to protect yourself during the day and that we need to use our computers, etc. But at night, while we're sleeping, is when our body really does a lot of its good healing work. So if you have a wireless router, shut it off at night. Uh, don't have anything plugged in around your bed. Uh, there are special kinds of switches you can get that turn the electricity off in your bedroom. And when we wire from a uh, brand new house, is very easy to just do that from the start. Um, if someone's very sensitive and there are, is a lot of radiation coming into the house from outside, there are solutions. Um, I can tell you about a good website in Canada. Is okay. that am I allowed to do that? Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. Okay, SafeLivingTechnologies.ca. They're out of, I believe, Guelph, Ontario. Uh, Rob Metzinger. He's one of our instructors at the Building Biology Institute, and he has um, both a roster of uh, people who can do this kind of inspection and uh, very good tools for measurement. But he also has the tools for remediating spaces. So, um, for example, there is a bed canopy that one can place over their bed, uh, and it will block any uh, radiation. It has to be done properly, or you can trap radiation, and it'll bounce around all night. So, you need to know what you're doing. But um, there has been uh, some organizations have found real help. For example, for autistic children, by setting up their bedrooms so they're in a EMR free zone at night. Um, yeah, that's uh, um, it makes sense because even if you turn off your own Wi-Fi, there's you know ten of your neighbors coming in your house. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it's um, I'm not sure we can get away from it if we live in a city setting. Yeah, but the good news is, in many many cases, the best thing you know the strongest signals are coming from generated from within the house. So by taking a few measures turning off your cell phones, turning off electricity around your room, and turning off the router, you can make a huge impact. Yeah. Um, I, I know most people listening are going to say they use their cell phone as a, their alarm clock, but it's very easy to put that into airplane mode and still have it beside your bed. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break. We're talking today to Paula Baker-Laporte, who is the co-author of Prescriptions for a Healthy House. She's an architect and specializes in building biology. So we're talking today about um, how your environment, your home can make you sick and what you can do about it. If you have any questions or comments about this show, you can message us on Facebook or Twitter or send us an email at anantacalgary at gmail.com. We'll be back shortly. Ouch! What do you think of when you think of dental procedures? Well, when you think about it, the teeth and the rest of the body are strongly connected. What happens in one part affects the other. In the Tooth Body Connection with host Dr. Don Ewing, we'll explain more about these concepts as well as discuss the role that your teeth play in your overall health. You'll learn about amalgams and how removing them the wrong way can be toxic to your body. Tune in Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. Do you find yourself caring for people in multiple generations? Are you exhausted, stressed, and overwhelmed? 
Instead of spending hours searching for resources and information, Dr. Merrill and her guests will provide you with practical, everyday information and solutions to help make your life easier. Tune in to Caught Between Generations, Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Time, on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We are bombarded with information daily about happy life strategies, beauty products, and business success ideas. Are they truly going to make a change or just take the change out of your pocket? Tune in to Shelly's Show and Tell with host Shelly Hancock. Shelly will explore and recommend proven business ideas as well as show you how to use the law of attraction to create health, happiness, and a prosperous business. Listen Mondays at 1 p.m. Pacific Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time on Voice America Health and Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. Um, we're talking today to Paula Baker Laporte, who is the co-author of Prescriptions for a Healthy House. She is an architect and specializes in building biology, which um, is uh, basically we're talking today about how your home can be making you sick and what you can do about it. So, Paula, I know a lot of people um, who are listening are probably wondering, you know, they've got that renovation planned and they want to know what they can do so it doesn't have, you know, a um, hundred of those 84,000 chemicals in it. Um, you mm-hmm. know, one thing that most people do is they do paint. And um, mm-hmm. is there a way that people can get paint that's not as toxic as we're used to seeing? Very much so. Uh, there, we now have a... a wide variety of paints that are zero VOC, and that means there's no volatile organic compounds in them once they're dry. Uh, they, so that means that they won't have a lingering odor. So when I look for paint, I look for three different qualities, uh, one that is zero VOC and one that has a colorant system that's zero VOC, and some major manufacturers now have colorant systems that are zero VOC. What that means is it used to be you'd buy a good paint, but that the, when you put the color in, it would off-gas um, because it's solvent-based, and the more color, the more richer the color, the more it would outgas. But now several of the major companies have um, uh, paints that have zero VOC colorants. And the third thing that I look for is something without biocides or chemical biocides. Um, because, uh, you know, again, trying to uh, reduce the amount of biocides in the environment as much as possible. And there are very few paints that have all three of those qualities, but there are some out there. Um, AFM is a company that's been around for years producing uh, products for chemically sensitive people, and their, their paint is one of, the, of about four that I know of that has those qualities. And then if you... If someone can consider, um, there are things like clay plasters or other kinds of wall coatings that are, um, go from being not just non-toxic but also actually impart some other kinds of healthy qualities to the house. And so if, if you can consider that, if it's within your budget, you can really help transform the feel of a house by doing a plaster instead of a paint, for example. Okay. Um so it are these must they must have websites so they're not too hard to find this kind of paint I'm hoping um well yes there are um uh, green seal is uh one outfit there are several outfits that uh, look at paint um I don't have that information. No, that's okay. But, uh, <laughs> know you know, know, a good start is just, you know, nowadays you can Google in uh, zero VOC paint and zero VOC colorant, and uh, several several will come up. Yeah. And so it's, and it's much uh, easier now. 
Yeah. So, and when people do renovations, there's often they're doing something like their kitchen. So they're getting new cupboards. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, you know, especially if they're um, going with particle board or even something that's been stained, um, right. of course, that's going to have something in it. So is there a way that they can do that that's um, less toxic? Yes. Um, there are now, um, it used to be that all interior grade plywoods had, um, formaldehyde in them that in a very volatile form called urea formaldehyde. And now there are many products on the market, uh, sheet goods, that uh, have the formaldehyde taken out of them. In fact, California has set one of the most rigid standards in the world. So anything that's K-A, I mean, sorry, C-A-R-B-2 compliant is going to be very low outgassing. Uh, CARB-2 stands for California Air Resource Board. It's their second round of standards, and they're very good. And because California is such a big market, uh, Matt, when they pass something into law, manufacturers pay attention. So uh, that's one part of it is getting um, inside materials, the carcass or the boxes that are non-toxic. And then, uh, the other thing is what kind of finish is going on it. And... Um, so, again, there's good and bad uh, finishes out there, and there are many good choices. And there are some cabinet companies that actually specialize in non-toxic uh, cabinetry, kitchen cabinetry. So, again, a little Google search will get you to some major companies. Uh, Neil Kelly is one that comes to mind, and I'm not sure if there are any just in Canada that we don't have in the States. There may well be. Um. Of course, of course, the next step is then floors, which is mm-hmm. what most people do when they renovate. Um, and I know carpets and flooring have different issues. Mm-hmm. So um, what can go wrong with your carpets? Well, um, there, there's uh, uh, in our book, if someone picks up our book, you'll find there's about three or four pages of why you should never have a carpet and then the next Big section is dedicated to if you're going to have a carpet, here's how to do it. So it's uh, so there are better uh, carpets out there. You need to pay attention to the underpad, the carpeting, the finish on the carpet, um, the glues if there, it's glued down, the seaming tapes. So you know we've we've called all that out. And um, but still, you, you know, would you ever? Um, glue down your sheets and then uh, vacuum them once a month and never wash them? You know, it's an absurd question. Of course not. But uh, where do our kids play? On the carpet. And um, over time, a carpet will accumulate a lot of dust and debris and dirt and pesticides. Um, So if you do have carpet, uh, there are things you can do to make it better. I'll just go over a couple of them. But if I have anything to say, you know, any influence to give, I'd say that's one of the major, major things that I I advise people to do is get flooring surfaces that can be easily cleaned, that are non-toxic, and then put throw rugs on if you want soft. But um, so that company I mentioned before, AFM, has a whole carpet system where you would uh, shampoo it with their shampoo and then spray it with their spray, which is... Uh, a healthy version of Scotchgard that locks in some of the chemicals and odors so you're not breathing it. So that's one good thing you can do. You can't do it on a wool carpet uh, because it would shrink. And most, the vast majority of wool carpets are mothballed, so they have uh, pesticides in them so that moths won't attack them. So a lot of people think, oh, wool's a better solution. It is in some respects, but uh, you, you would want to find one that doesn't have... Um, biocides in it, and then have a strategy for how you're going to keep moths out of it. So you you really have a lot to think about. Uh, But if you just have a regular carpet and want to improve it, one piece of equipment that's essential is a very good HEPA vacuum. So this is a vacuum with um, a high-efficiency filtration built into it. Because all, if you, you know, with a standard va- uh, vacuum cleaner, you think you're cleaning your carpet, but if someone were to take air samples before and after you vacuum, your air would be much more polluted after because of all the dust that's um, thrown into the air. 
So you would want a vacuum that um, picks up all those fine particulates so it doesn't go into your breathing space. And then uh, the amount of, uh, you don't just go over a spot once. You, you need to vacuum very, very, very thoroughly going over and over the same spot in order to truly pick up all the dust and debris that's accumulated. Anyone who's ever renovated and pulled out a carpet will know what I'm talking about because they'll see piles of dirt under it. Another important thing with carpeting is if you must have it or do have it and not time to change it out, uh, issue a no-shoes policy in your house. So have a place at the door where people take their shoes off, slippers if people want to get into them. But, for example, the highest rates of pesticide indoors are found in the carpeting in Florida because everything is pesticided outside and then people walk on that and then they walk on the carpet and rub it off on the carpet and... As I said, that's where infants play. Mm -hmm. Um, So what do you recommend instead of having carpeting? Uh, Well, uh, tile, wood, cork, real battleship linoleum, um, bamboo. These are all, um, with each of those, there are uh, healthier and less healthier options, but those are all options where you can get a healthy floor that's uh, easily cleaned. And so these don't have any treatments on them that's going to off-gas or cause issues? Well, they can. Um, with tile, you want to uh, make sure, you know, if you get one that's factory sealed so you're not sealing it in the house, there are, um, if you want to seal the joints, again, AFM makes the only grout sealer that I know. There are grouts with chemicals or without. There are... Um, you know, the actual adhesive that's used on the back or the mortar, there are ones with or without chemicals. So, there's, you know, there's definitely things to know uh, with wood. How is it finished? How is it glued down or nailed? How, what's under it um, and what's in it? Uh, I think people are, there's, there was a lot of publicity of some uh, tongue and groove uh, engineered flooring that came from China and it was full of formaldehyde, for example. But... Uh, mm. For every option, there are healthy options out there. You can either go to, um, there are you know, many consultants who can, who specialize in this now, who can help you through a healthy system, or you can find out so much information online by just Google healthy wood flooring or healthy, uh, healthier carpeting or healthy tile installation, and you'll get some good information and you'll get some greenwashing. So both exist, of course, on the internet. Everything exists. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I think we've all gone out and bought new furniture, and um, mm-hmm. does that have an issue as well? Sure. Uh, with uh, you know what you would want for wooden furniture, solid wood. So a lot of furniture, if you look under it, it's print made out of press board. Um, for upholstered furniture, the ideal would be to have to not have polyurethane in the home because polyurethane is full of um, fire retardants and couches break down over time. Uh, yet most upholstered furniture has um, poly- foams with fire retardants. There has been a big uh, movement to get rid of those fire retardants, so we're seeing better options. There are a few companies that will make uh, furniture with real latex or real organic cotton or wool stuffing and um, uh, non-synthetic fibers on the outside and solid wood. Uh, there's not a lot of them, but there's a few out there. So uh, furnishing is tricky, and uh, furnishing, even if you have the healthiest home and you bring in toxic furniture, your air is soon going to be polluted. Of course, the most important piece of furniture is the bed. That's where you do your sleeping and healing. And um, so the building biology ideal would be a non-metal frame, a non-metal box, you know, box spring, so not metal springs. And the European-style beds that sit on a slatted frame are a good solution. Uh, there are wool beds. There are natural latex beds. There's combinations of organic cotton and wool. So there are options out there. Um, You have, in Canada, you have um, Shepherd's Dream. I think it's in Manitoba. And they make an all-wool bed. 
and it's a beautiful bed. We have a, the American version of it, uh, so it's worth checking out. You so, also have, uh, I was just thinking in Toronto, yep. you have a couple of other natural bed companies. So uh, spread throughout Canada, you have some good options. Okay, well, that, that's um, that's good because I think that's something people don't think about. I mean, you um, buy a bed, so you get one with a pillow top and a and a box spring, and you don't think about um, that as an issue ever. I think yeah. I've very rarely heard that as something people think about. Um, and you know, you asked me what's most important to start with, and I said, well, what's most wrong with the house? But I, I, I would like to also introduce a new concept um, that we haven't talked about, and that's the bedroom as a sanctuary. So mm-hmm. if everything's, you know, pretty much you don't have a glaring issue and you want to start somewhere to improve the health of your house, start in the bedroom. That's and, good advice. You know, yeah. I, I um, read somewhere that that's actually the last room that gets renovated because people do the living room and the kids' rooms and the kitchen, mm-hmm. and they mm-hmm. forget to make their room pretty because, you know, no one sees it except you. And and um, there's so many reasons now why that should become a priority to, you know, deal with the toxicity there, but also to make it special so you can heal there when you're dealing with all this other stuff mm-hmm. going on in your house. Yes, it is the, um, again, barring some uh, uh, standout problem, it is the most important room to start with for your health. Yeah, you can't get better if your bedroom's toxic or Mm -hmm. your house, for that matter. So before we end the show, is there any last advice you'd like to give our listeners? Um. Well, the one thing I would just like to emphasize that we've already said is, although it's scary out there when you look at all the things that can be wrong and all the, th- all the chemicals that are out there and how little we know and how little direction there is, the good news is that um, there are many, many uh, ways to improve the health of your house and um, uh, educating yourself is the first step. And... There is more awareness growing, so there are more and more products that are safe to use. Um, so it's important both what, what your house is made out of and don't forget what you bring into it is just as important. Uh, okay. you know, don't use pesticides and don't use uh, air fresheners, chemical air fresheners, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Is there a way that people can get a hold of you if they have any questions? Oh, sure. Um, uh, info at Econest. Uh, that's our, uh, yeah. the best way to get hold of me. So okay. that's I N F O at Econest dot com. E C O N E S T dot com. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all this information. I think this is really important. I'm glad we we had this conversation. Oh, you're very welcome, Rebecca. And it's really um, thank you for the opportunity to spread this valuable information that people need to know about. Um, So we were talking today with Paula Baker Laporte, who is the co-author of Prescriptions for a Healthy House. She is an architect and specializes in building biology. So we talked today about how you can protect yourself and your family and make your home a safer, healthier place. Um, If you have any questions about this show, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email at anantacalgary at gmail.com or message us on Facebook or Twitter. We'd love to hear your comments. Make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week. Thanks again for listening to the preceding program brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. 
The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the preceding program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio 